when you have love for each other. And this is what they had. They had this love, and Paul is commending them for them. He's praising God for the love they had for each other. And then he comes on, he says, for their hope. The hope that they had, the hope in the return of Jesus. That was their hope, and that was their passion and what they were living for. And then he goes on further. The next thing he says, he said, for the assurance of the gospel, verses 5 and 6. He said, you have the assurance of the coming of Christ. You have the assurance that you're going to be accepted by God. They understood it was not how good we become. They understood that it was because of their acceptance by God that they had the hope of a place with God in heaven. And he praises them for this and he gives them credit. And then he, he thanks them for Epaphras for coming and sharing the gospel with them. He was like the evangelist who came into the town and talked to them. Now he moves into a, a prayer for the people. And you'll see in this prayer that he, he's starting to pray here now, he starts to slide in little references to this problem of syncretism, of mixing all these things together. He says, I pray for you that you'll know God's will. And he said, to know God's will is to have spiritual wisdom, understanding, and spiritual insight. Can, can you see there that there's a sort of a circular action to have, have spiritual insight is to have spiritual wisdom and understanding. To have spiritual wisdom and understanding is to have spiritual insight. In other words, as we, as, we, as we feed on the Word, as we dig into the Word, and the primary source of the Word, friends, I'm talking about here, not all the books and things that have been written about it, but feed on the Word, we develop spiritual insight. That's what he's saying. You have understanding of the will of God. And he, and he was encouraging them to do this against the syncretism that was permeating their camp. And next thing he prayed for that they would be filled with the power of God. And I love this because so often I see that as Christians we sometimes want the power of God to be able to do great things. Well, he doesn't say that. He says to have the power of God to endure how much? Everything with patience. I can do that. I'm just about coming to that stage now, but I haven't mastered the second one with joy. I can endure it with patience because many times I don't have any say into it. This weather, for example, I endure it with patience because I have no choice. But do I do it with joy? Yes, see, I'm smiling. I do it with joy. See what I mean again? This is what he's saying to these Christians. He said, endure everything with patience. That's what we need the power of God for. And he says, be thankful. Be thankful to God for he has qualified us into his kingdom. And, and again, and we're having a Bible study here, and sometimes I like to mix sermons up a bit, have something a bit lighter. But seeing it's in the winter, and it's cooler, and we can sit a bit longer in church, have something a bit heavier, we're going to be a little bit of theology this morning. You notice he says, he has. And in the Greek, that's the aorist tense, which means past action complete. He has completed and qualified us into the kingdom of God. He has done it. That's rejoicing. Isn't it? That's good news. He has done, and he says, because he has taken us out of the kingdom of darkness and he has brought us into the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light. He has done it. And now we come into the section for today that Rod read the, um, the scripture reading for, the power of the cross. And I like the translation there, Rod, the God's Bible, God's word. That's very good. Mm. Right, verse 6, he says, You have trusted Jesus to save you. Now trust him for each day's problems. You have trusted Jesus. He's gone through, we looked at those just very quickly in a little snapshot view of where we're going with it. And he has talked about how they understood the gospel, understood the assurance of salvation. He says, Now you trust Jesus for that. Trust him for each day's problems. You know, I, I've started in my second year my little business and electrical work and I never realised in the second year it's a disaster. Everything seems to come upon you. You know, you have ACC suddenly you lose its head. Um, you have extra tax you have to pay. All this stuff suddenly hits you in the second year and I says, Lord, all this work I've been doing, I thought I was doing reasonably, but suddenly you realise you're going backwards. Not quite, but almost. What does it say? Trust Jesus for each day's problems. Wow. Trust him for each day's problems. He says, you trust him to save you? Now trust him in your living. I, I remember a, a, a story 
and, and it came from that um, film, Apollo 13, but it was based on a true story. The young pilot was out on night um, reconnaissance in the Pacific Ocean off an aircraft carrier. There were several planes out. And this young pilot, he was out, he was way up high, doing all sorts of manoeuvres up there, way up sky. And he sort of forgot about time, forgot about everything out there in the beautiful evening, beautiful night sky. And he was soaring here and going there and going there. And he looked at his fuel and he thought, it's getting down, I better start heading back to the mother ship. If his GPS, nothing, it didn't work, it wasn't on. He said, that's funny. Try to switch on, it wouldn't come on. All his navigational equipment failed. And he thought, wow, where am I? Looking at his fuel and thinking, this is a bit risky, but he wasn't too worried. And he started heading for the boat. Where was he going to head? I mean, he had a compass. He knew where north and south were, east and west. But where was the mother ship? He had no idea. Was he on this side of it or that side? Was he front of it or back of it? He had no idea. So he came down as low as he could go above the ocean to try and search out where the ship was. Not a thing in sight. He couldn't see a thing. And as he was floundering along, wondering what he was going to do, suddenly the cabin lights went out. Failed. Everything was in darkness. And now he began to panic because he knew the fuel was getting down. What was he going to do? And he says, at the time, I didn't realize, but at the time, the failure of the cabin lights was my saviour. Because when the cabin lights failed, a little time later, as he got down very low, he could see something like a shiny surface, very dim, but he could see it on the ocean. As he kept on going, he kept looking, he noticed that it was getting a little brighter. And what it was, it was, you know how in the water sometimes you get the fluorescent behind the waves of a big boat, way behind the boat? It'll cause a fluorescent wake in the water. That's what he picked up, and he suddenly realized what it was. And he headed that wake, that color of that wake, all the way back and landed safely on the mothership. And his comment was this. He says, in tight situations in life, never give up because we don't know what's around the corner. This is exactly what Paul is saying to the Christians here in Colossae. He says, you trusted in Jesus to save you. Now trust him for each day's problems. Verse 7, he says, rooted and built in him. Here he's talking about stability in the Christian life. And, and, and I want to tell you, friends, there's something that the Christian community needs more than anything else today is stability. And he says, stability is in Jesus, like a tree with its roots planted down. And Rod was telling the story to the children. We had the same problem with these big winds that we had up there last week. And that huge rain and the big winds blew. And we heard a little noise, like a thump. We went out into the dining room area. It looks out across to Highway 10. And there was our beautiful big rhododendron tree. It's a very old tree. And at each spring it comes out with the most beautiful flowers just covered in it. It's a beautiful showing. And there it was flat on the ground, snapped off at the bottom. No stability, see? No roots. Over. And so Paul is saying here, rooted and built in Christ. See that no one takes you captive, he said. And the word captive is to, to rob. See that no one takes it away from you, that removes it from you. And what was it he says there? By philosophy. No, he doesn't say philosophy, but what he actually says in the scripture there is by deceptive philosophy, he says. There's nothing wrong with philosophy because philosophy is really human reasoning. And scripture even says, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah said, come now, let us reason together. We've got to use, God's given us a brain. He wants us to use the brain that he's given to us. He says, come reason together. But the problem was human philosophy. I want you to just turn back in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 where he deals with this problem also here. 1 Corinthians in chapter 2 and the same thought is expressed here in verses 1 and 3 where he says here, When I came to you, my friends, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You see, friends, we must never, ever lose the power of the cross. 
That's why Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that you, your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. What a guy, huh? What a guy. I didn't come with persuasive words and flowery language. I just came to you with the power of the cross so that your faith might rest on him, not on me or human beings. What an example of every preacher, isn't it? The power of the cross. rests on him. And then he goes into further deals with the basic principal elements of the world in the text further back in Colossians where he brings up that syncretism problem again. Then in verse 9 he says, In all Christ, all the fullness of the deity, the Godhead, lives in a bodily form. You know what? Just a little sidelight on this because some of you will be aware that there's quite a lot of discussion in the Adventist church at the moment. I don't know whether it's so much here in Whangarei, but it's certainly in other places. In Australia, it's very rampant over there, is discussion on the Trinity. Have you heard any of the discussion on the Trinity? No, not a problem. Okay. Well, it is in some places, I can assure you. I am amazed at how Adventists are wanting to go back to some of the, the Aryan views of the Trinity. And so I like to use the word here that's used in Scripture, that the Godhead in the King James use, or the deity. In Christ, all the fullness, all the fullness of him, he was in God, was in his human form. He was God. All the fullness of the Godhead lives in him. And here he, he talks about what he talked about before in the supremacy of Christ. And then verse 10 he says, you have been given full life in union with Christ. And you know what I've discovered? That we only reach our full potential in life, our spiritual potential, as we are deepened and rooted in him. And you can see what, what Paul is doing here. He's trying to teach these believers that all these, all these deities that they had and all these other views of philosophy and they had series of angels that would reach out that they could do the pathway up to God and the top of them was Christ and then the next step was up to God. That, that was the view they had. And he's saying, look, all of the deity is in Christ. You don't need all these steps. It's in him. I was talking to a person the other day who was a Catholic and he, he was so, what, discouraged, I think, was the word to use because he said, look, I've suddenly discovered in my, in my life as a Christian, I don't need the priest. I don't need the Pope. I don't need all these things. I just need Jesus. And I said, hallelujah, brother. You've got it. <laughs> That's true, isn't it? And that's what he's saying here to these people. All you need is Jesus. You don't need all these deities, all these pathways up to God. Oh, he goes on again with the head of the power and over the syncretism. Now he comes to two illustrations, and this is interesting here. In verse 11, his first illustration was that of circumcision. And what, what Paul is trying to do here now, he's addressing the Jewish people in the group that were there. It was made of a lot of Jews there. And he's addressing them. And he's dealing with the issue of the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. That's what he's dealing with. Now, we have argued many times as, as Adventists, and somewhat correctly so, that the difference between the moral law and the ceremonial law and one versus the other and so on, that really is not the argument in the New Testament. The argument in the New Testament is not whether one law is done away with it. Not. It's got nothing to do with that. The argument in the New Testament is, are we living under the letter of the law experience or the spirit of the law experience? That's the argument. And here he's addressing that point with these people. He says, we need to live under the spirit of the law. You know, the, the, the letter of the law, the Jews had this kind of a concept. They would sit down in the evening and they would go through the Ten Commandments and they'd tick everyone off. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Honor the Lord thy God. Don't take God's name in vain. And they'll tick them all off. And they'll say, yes, we've arrived. And I've heard, I've heard Adventists say the same thing. They have said to me, the only thing we've got to do, Pastor, is only got to keep the Ten Commandments and we'll be in the kingdom of God. Jesus said when he came to this earth, he said, I say unto you of old, that it says thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus was quoting from the Ten Commandments, that which was written down in the law, thou shalt not commit adultery. But he said, but I say unto you, 
if you look after women lustfully in your heart and continue to do so, you're committing adultery. Then Jesus went a little further and he said, I say, it says of old time that it says, Thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, if you're angry with your brother and you can't forgive your brother or your sister, you're guilty of murder. Friends, Jesus was more concerned about motives and attitudes of the heart than external forms of religion. This is why did you say, oh, that doesn't happen. I tell you, it does happen. I've been to several churches and been involved with churches. And I've had people that can sit in a church situation, sit down and discuss in a Sabbath school lesson what we should be doing on Sabbath and the things that we can't do and the things as Christians we can do and on Saturday night go out to the massage parlors. The same people. And I'm not talking about massage parlors where you get a massage for health. Not that kind of massage parlor. And you tell me that they've got the true message of God? Yet they won't break the Sabbath. You get my point? The point is, is not the Sabbath is God's gift and, and, and I want to treasure the Sabbath very dearly and the Ten Commandments are very special, but the Ten Commandments as they stand in the book of Exodus 20 are the basics of what God requires of us. Just the basics. God wants us to be mature and to grow. And this is what Paul is saying to these believers in Christ. I want you to grow. I don't want you to stay with the letter of the law. I want you to move into the spirit of the law. What it really meant. You know, in 2 Corinthians 3, 3, Paul said this. He said, the letter of the law was glorious. Moses had to put a veil on his face. But I want to tell you the spirit of the law is even more glorious because it's centered in Christ. That's what he's saying here. And friends, we've got to learn this lesson, I believe, as Adventists that what we have, the Ten Commandments, is a very special treasure that we need to hang on to and to guard very carefully. But it's like the doing maths. When I started as a primary school child, I learned my tables. One and one and two, two and two and three, two and two and four and so on. But as I grew up, I started doing calculus, I started doing higher mathematics. It doesn't do away with the tables, get my point? But I've grown. And one of the tragedies I see with some of our folk is that we have never grown. We're still living under the letter of the law experience. And God said, I want you to move from that. I want you to move in the spirit of the law. And people dare to tell me it's an easier way. Friends, I want to tell you, it's much easier to live under the letter of the law. Much, much easier. I can tick those off, no problem. But when it comes to loving my brother and loving my enemies, God, give me strength to do it because I can't do it on my own. That's what God requires of me. It doesn't do away with one. It just makes it more glorious. That's why Jesus said, I've come not to do away with it. I've come to fill it full. Show you what I really meant. You know, when you go back and have a look at those people back there in Exodus 20, they had had four generations in slavery. Their minds were like pygmies. And as God brought them out, he had to start from the ABCs. You shall not do this. You shall not do that. Bang, bang, bang. I, I, I learned this lesson so amazing when I was in Papua New Guinea. I used to run some marriage enrichment for the ministers because in Papua New Guinea, the, the women there have a terrible role in life. You see them with a big load of firewood tied on their back. Hanging underneath that is a big billum with cow cow, which is um, kumra. And then they have a baby on top of that again. And they're going down the road like this, walking down the road like this. And, 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 and there's their husband, he's got a bush knife, just a bush knife, standing in front, striding in front of her, you know, protecting the way. Nobody's going to hurt her, but that's what he's doing, you see. He won't offer to carry anything for her at all. So I used to try and teach these guys, they've got to respect their wives. You know, God says, you're one, you love each other and so on. And I thought I was getting through, and I thought, I'm getting this through, they're getting it up. And that night, one of the women came running to me, and she said, come and see, Pastor, come and see. And I went there and there was this woman sitting outside her little thatched house bleeding from the mouth her husband who was a pastor in my class had kicked the daylights out of her because she hadn't come home to cook his tea. And one of the other pastors who was could speak good English he could understand our ways 
He said, leave it to me, pastor. He picked this guy up by the scruff of his neck and lifted his feet off the ground and shook him under the chin like this. And he says, you dare do that again, I'll beat you to death. You know what, it worked. He never hit his wife again. Now that's an extreme case, I'm telling you. But God was faced with a similar problem, friends, with Israel. How can I teach these people the principles of love and worship and respect and honour when they don't know even their right hand from their left? So I had to spell it out in the Ten Commandments. But Jesus said, I want you to grow. I want you to grow. That's what Paul is saying to the people here, the difference between the two. And then in verse 12, he used the illustration of baptism. Death and burial. You know the one very well. You know all that. He's, he's using that same illustration. And this illustrates two points, this illustration he puts in here in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. That the first thing is that we can overcome evil desires in our life. We can overcome evil desires in our life. But we have to be identify what evil desires are. And this is where we've got to always stick with scripture and stick with the context. Because I'm going to tell you why in a moment. In Colossians chapter 3, he begins to point out what some of these are. Chapter 3 and verse 5, just jumped ahead of it. Therefore put to death whatever things belong to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And then he goes down a bit further, verse 8, he says, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off the old self. And so he identifies them, exactly what he means by victory over our evil desires. And I, and I want to say here this morning, friends, that I believe that through the strength of Christ and the power of the gospel in our lives, we can overcome those things. And we as Christians, all of us here have been on the journey for a long time, we should not be bothered with that stuff anymore. We should have moved on from that. But there's another thing that I find from here, that what I learned from this experience that I'm seeing here in the book of Colossians, is that for some of us, we have carried unnecessary guilt. And some of you who are not so long in the family won't understand what I'm saying here, but some of you who have been in the family a long time, as long as I have, will know exactly what I mean. And if you disbelieve me, just come with me and I can show you them by their thousands who are so burdened down with guilt that they won't even come inside an Adventist church anymore because it stirs up all those emotions. Because we burden them down with unnecessary guilt. Paul is not saying that. He's saying deal with your evil desires. We put guilt on people that we didn't need to put on. And one of the burdens of my ministry in the past has been, I did the same thing and I feel so sorry about it now. And I've written to some of those people and asked for their forgiveness. It's not our role to do that, friends. It's the role of the Holy Spirit to touch people's hearts and to change their lives and not burden down people with unnecessary guilt. Then he comes into my favourite part, the power of the cross. And we really uplifts what Jesus did on the cross. And notice how he does this. First of all, he says that we were dead. I've used the person, I've changed it to the person so it applies to me as an individual, you as an individual. I was dead in my sins. This happened at Eden. You remember at Eden? When we decided to go our own way? The death penalty was placed upon the human race. God said, in the day you touch, bingo. And I want to tell you what I believe that unless it wasn't for, if it wasn't for Jesus who jumped in right at that moment and spoke for us, we would have been zapped there and then. Curtains. But Jesus jumped in. Genesis 3.15 and stood between our first parents and God. But the death penalty was still on. The wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve, Romans 3. Then he says, the next point he says, I'm doing these points in order as they come through this passage. Jesus then forgave my sin. You see, Jesus didn't come to tell us how to live, but he came to mend that broken relationship. Because what sin did, it separated man from God. 
And we often think about sin as acts and little things that we do. It's much bigger than that. Sin is a separation from God. Because we're separated from God, that's why we do these stupid things. What are you saying? I want to build that relationship up. And then you won't be troubled with all this little stuff in your past. Build the relationship. That's what, that's what he's trying to do. Jesus forgave us and Jesus built that relation. And then Jesus died and rose for me. I want you, I want you to turn something. The best way I can describe this is, is Revelation chapter 14. I've come over to Revelation 14 and we know this passage so well because it's right in the heart of the three angels' messages. Revelation 14 and, and verse 9. Well, if you come with me, um, you remember the first time, just Adventists, we, we should know, we should know the, the, this three angels' message. What's the first angels' message? You yelled out, what's the first angels' message? You'd be able to snap it out like this. Everlasting gospel to all the world for the judgment hour has come. The two go together. You can't have the presentation of the gospel without judgment. Do you know that? I repeat that. You cannot have the everlasting gospel being preached without judgment because when people hear the gospel, they have to do one or two things, accept or reject. You can say, but they can ignore it. No, you can't. If you ignore it, you reject it. So it's either one or two things. You either accept or you reject. And as Jesus said, he that believeth on me has eternal life and has already passed from death to Life. See? So you cannot preach the gospel without the judgment. The judgment hour message went out in AD 31. The moment Christ ascended to heaven, the judgment hour message went out to the world. For the hour of his judgment is come. The gospel and judgment always go together. You cannot separate them. Cannot be separated. And then the second angel was a call out of Babylon. Why? Because people had rejected the first. They'd rejected the gospel. God's giving them a warning. Come back to the first angel. That's the message. And then finally goes the fourth angel. They have reached it. Bang. Mark of the beast. And remember it says that they drink of the cup of God's wrath. The cup of God's wrath. And I used to, I used to really worry about that because I think, you know, that people who worship on a different day for me are lovely people. They're going to drink of the cup of God's wrath. You know what this is talking about, friends? This picture here of these people drinking of the cup of God's wrath is a reference back to Gethsemane. You remember when Jesus was in Gethsemane? There it says he was, prayed this prayer, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. There wasn't a cup there. He was not holding a cup in his hand. It was an allegorical cup. It was a metaphor. Father, take this cup. Take this experience away from me. And then he went back, and he goes back again. And friends, he does it three times. It says in the book of Matthew that he actually fell with his face to the ground and cried, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. You know what he was doing? He was drinking from the cup of God's wrath. Can you imagine that? The Son of God, all the deity lives in this person. And now here Paul is saying that he is actually drinking from the cup of God's wrath. Why? Because it was my sin that was being nailed to the cross. He was carrying my sin. And he was treated like I should have been treated. And he has experienced the cup of God's wrath to its full, and he trembles. You know, Mel Gibson tried to present the suffering of Christ, the physical suffering of Christ in the film The Passion. He could not portray this kind of suffering. The physical suffering of Christ was bad enough, yes, but it was nothing compared to what Jesus went through. That's not what destroyed him. It was that he was experiencing the, the wrath of God on the Son of God. I don't know if you can begin to make, fathom that. And remember, he's experienced that for you and for me. This is why in Revelation, because they reject Jesus, they reject the everlasting gospel. That's why they're drinking the cup of God's wrath. They have to drink it for themselves. Because they didn't let Jesus drink it in Gethsemane. I'm going to tell you why when this suddenly hit me, I just, I just felt like falling down like Jesus and saying, Lord, wow, what a saviour. See, it's not just that Jesus died for us. And that's what a lot of people think it all is, just that Jesus died and went back to heaven again. No. He experienced and tasted the cup of God's wrath for me. This is what can change lives, friends. This is what will change. This is the power 
that can change hearts. Then he goes on and he says that Jesus cancelled my death sentence. That was what was back in Eden, remember, where the death sentence was placed upon the human race. By Jesus dying on the cross, he cancelled my death sentence and symbolically nailed it to the cross. Wasn't the ceremonial law that Jesus nailed to the cross? The ceremonial law was never against us. What he nailed to the cross was my sin. That's what he nailed there. He nailed it to the cross. What a saviour. He, he didn't actually nail it to the cross. I mean, the only thing that was nailed to the cross was a sign that said, Jesus, King of the Jews. It was a symbolic act again. He nailed my sin. My sin has already been dealt with at Calvary. That's why I'm free. That's why I have the assurance. I can reject that. Yes, once saved, always saved. No! But I can reject. And then through the power of his life, he wants to live by the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit in my life. That's Christianity. That's what will set this world on fire. That's what will set this church on fire. We get the power of the cross. Understand what Jesus actually did here. And he disarmed all the mythological deities. It's quite interesting here because in here Jesus is actually speaking in the language of the cultic of his day. I mean Paul is actually speaking in the cultic language of his day in order to reach the cultic mind with the gospel. He's not saying he believes in all these mythological deities. He's not saying that at all. But he says Jesus is above them all. But what he's trying to do, he's speaking in their language to try and reach them with the, the, the superiority and the power of Christ. And it's a good evangelistic tool. We should do it more often in our evangelism. Speak with the mind of the people that understand. And because of that, he triumphed over the cross. What a saviour. You wonder why someone get passionate about it? I get excited. People say, what do you get so excited about? I tell you what, I get excited about this stuff. I really do. It reminds me of Martin Luther. Martin Luther was brought before the Council of Worms to answer for his faith. And he was told that he would probably face the death penalty. And what was his answer? You may be surprised to learn this. I, 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 I was surprised when I discovered in my learning of history, church history. Martin Luther stood. People waited. There was a long pause. And he spoke silently and softly and timidly. And he was asked to speak up because they couldn't hear. And he said, I... I don't really know. I think I need more time to think about it. And he was given the time. He went back and he spent the next few nights in prayer and searching his heart. It was during this experience that he discovered what I've been trying to share with you here this morning. Colossians, the power of the cross. He was religious. He was a letter of the law man. A good man, yes. But he had never discovered the power of the cross and what was actually involved. And during those few days, he discovered the power of the cross. And suddenly he got things into focus. And suddenly some of the things he counted as absolutes, he made them as non-essential. And now he was focused. And he went back into that room the next day. And they asked him again the same question, would he recant? He stood up and this time in a loud voice, he spoke those words that we all know so well. I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. The power of the cross.